Okay, we'll do something a little different today. Um, I've written some blog posts about sort of nitpicky technology issues that I've dealt with, and I've been looking them over, and I realize that they have a very uh, verbal style that's particular to my thought process, and I'm not really expecting this to be super interesting to anyone. There's not going to be any fancy video content. I'm just showing you some screenshots of my website, um, but I thought I would just read through these blog posts on these particular issues. So this is not general data instruction content. Please be warned. Uh, skip to other videos if that's what you're interested in, uh, but I'll jump right in. So this is my own website where I put various information. Um, I run the current instance of my blog here and I'm really talking here about the three uh, as of summer I'm recording this in summer 2024 but the blog posts date back to last year um, and I guess I don't know I'm still coming to terms with some of these issues but I'm gonna do three videos um, on these three so this one is diversification as risk management or disaster with AWS. That's Amazon Web Services. Um, and I'll just start reading. I will open up some of the tabs um, as I read to make it just a tiny bit interactive. And let's go. So this title, uh, as I said, sounds a bit Rocky and Bullwinkle to me. If you're not of the generation that's familiar with that, you can check the, the link. Um, but I find it's appropriate, right? I found this situation really surprised me, took me for a loop. <laughs> um, and so let's get right into it. So I have a, an older WordPress post that I've moved over to this blog um, on AWS backup. And that's uh, just to show you that um, I've got some history in this area. Uh, this is not a AWS newbie or anything. Um, but let me tell the story, right? So for the TLDR crowd, uh, the takeaways are labeled, this whole episode made me realize. Uh, I've been using AWS to serve all of my various websites for a long time, at least since 2011 for the first of them. And I used an S3 static website, uh, which could integrate certificates, HTTP to HTTPS redirects, CloudFront, uh, and so on was appealing and at the time the wide-scale adoption of AWS and associated documentation and help aided this process but I became complacent after having developed an unchanging routine for website development involving local Hugo generation delivered to AWS S3 with CloudFront and Route 53 serving as the glue to deliver the final product to the web I kept using that stack in an unquestioning manner, and during that time, AWS was reliable. But just as with bananas, a monoculture is vulnerable. So if you're not familiar with the problems with bananas, there's a link there that can help illuminate that. So June of 2023, somehow AWS had flagged my account for unauthorized activity. Uh, this is something that seems to happen to me in multiple contexts because I am a indiscriminate user of VPNs, right? I have multiple devices. They're logged into VPNs that are connected to different places. So, so I've noticed that it's not uncommon for providers to um, have a little issue with that. I feel that location-based uh, anything is a little silly in today's world. Um, but anyway, I don't actually really know why AWS flagged my account. Um, they sent me these very opaque messages, right? Which to me looked very similar to just plain old spam. Um, I've got a copy of one of those here. Nice, uh, you know, all caps. Um, it just, I, it, it, they did not catch my attention because I get a ton of junk mail. Um, they ended up in my spam folders because they look like spam. Um, but 
one day, a, a little time after these messages had uh, gone to my spam, I saw a prompt to change my password once I logged in. So I thought, oh, that's routine. Sites often force this on their users uh, from time to time. And it could be a requirement saying, okay, you need a longer password, you need to add special characters. After I changed my password, I received additional email that did get through to my active inbox about the issues with my account. So I went into my AWS console and I closed the issue. I hadn't noticed any unauthorized activity. Um, I thought the request to change my password was routine. Um, but And although I have had no actual explanation from Amazon about what happened, I now believe that closing the issue was the wrong thing to do. That was equivalent to marking my unauthorized use as not resolved. Um, and after I did that, I soon noticed the problems. So my websites served through Amazon went down. All of my sites were offline for hours. Uh, so much for Amazon's market leading reliability. I'm tempted to ad lib here a little bit, but I'm going to stick to the original post that I wrote. Uh, this whole episode made me realize just how opaque and unfriendly the Amazon diktats that one receives are. There was little, literally no guidance on how to resolve this issue from Big A or on what had caused it. So I searched online. Uh, went through a maze of pages about IAM users and policy authorizations, uh, something that Amazon has ramped up the complexity of um, over time. And so then it becomes very hard to identify the current information, um, what are you know the actual recommendations that apply now. So I, you know, I didn't resolve it. I contacted Amazon's chat help in the middle of the night. Uh, they did collect my information and they submitted it for verification and a few hours after that not sure when but while i was sleeping access was restored and i woke up to working websites okay so it was resolved um but the issues were a little bit um more than that so i'm going to get in into that this whole episode made me realize that the static website space, which I was attracted to for its simplicity, has evolved a lot since I started out with AWS as the default 10 years ago. There are many providers, many different strong points and use, different use cases, Netlify, Cloudflare, others uh, who are serving their users well. Um, and in this case, at that time, a year ago, I did not need Netlify's quick build features or heavy duty production process and potential costs. Uh, in the case of Cloudflare, their preference for use of their own DNS um, was the only thing keeping me away. At that time, I, there seemed to be workarounds for that. I'm still a bit doubtful. Uh, if I'm happy with anything, I, I am very happy with Gandhi DNS. Now that is the funny part of this post because this was summer 2023. And by the time we get to part three in this series, you will hear the update <laughs> to that. Um, now, I had no information from Amazon about what caused this issue, but it shook me up, right? So it, and this is, I've already mentioned this, it, it's about the, I think it might be about the VPN coming, logging in from multiple countries. Um, and basically, you know, I'm not going to change my practices just to not inconvenience Amazon. Uh, but also, this whole episode made me realize that I was overly dependent on a behemoth cor corporation to serve up material that ostensibly represents my academic career and other interests. Amazon has not been getting better lately. Uh, here's my behemoth link. Um, highly recommended. Uh, film that illuminates that topic in a more metaphorical way. Uh, Amazon has not been getting better acting in malevolent ways. Um, there is a, again, a, a post if you're interested in delving into that. 
There is no reason to believe that AWS is an exception to their corporate culture of dehumanizing pressure to perform to metrics and to automate out the human component of any interaction. If their e-commerce site is now notorious for selling counterfeit items and fly-by-night ersatz products, and Amazon's corporate mission was to destroy, <coughs> um, disrupt the market, why wouldn't AWS also be moving in that direction? So this whole episode made me realize that I had better investigate substitute ways of serving up my web content pronto. So the next post that I'll have a separate video about talks more about those solutions involving Render, DigitalOcean, Netlify, Versal. And I'm going to read this again. <laughs> You'll see my later problems with Gandhi. But at summer 2023, I said I wanted to give Gandhi a shout out for providing me with 100% reliable services in domain registration, DNS, and webmail for 20 years. Doing it with simplicity and user friendliness. That was the old Gandhi, yes. Um, and I never had any doubts, qualms, or suspicions. I guess, you know, saying these things calls down the fates upon you uh, when you do that. Um, so I tried to reduce my dependency on AWS. I used Gandhi DNS uh, instead of Route 53 and pointed it to render. And I was happy with that a year ago. But again, this whole episode made me realize that I had better diversify and have a few methods of serving up web content at my fingertips in case of issues with any other provider. So now I'm actively hosting my sites on a couple of new providers. I'm hanging on to my S3 buckets and methods for serving them from AWS just in case. But I sincerely hope that new AI or whatever alerting systems will not flag me as a pro problem user no matter what service I am on. However, the onus on the, is on the individual to protect themselves and manage their exposure and risk resulting from any one service provider. I hope I have now moved into that new, more diverse and protected space thanks to the cuckoo, AWS, nudging me out of the cozy nest they, nest they had once created. So this post was my first on Versal and uh, the second post goes into a little more detail about services, but, you know, Versal is one that is uh, still serving me well. Um, okay. And thanks to Versal for supporting me in a more secure and controllable life. So, was my title hyperbolic? Uh, no, I don't think so. And this paragraph is is in a sense the real key the, the thing that, that I'm most upset about still about that process um, if you have your core identity websites down for hours without knowing why yes it's a crisis um, the crisis was diagnosed uh, Amazon got my material back up and working um, but while I was in crisis and my account had been flagged uh, you know, my S3 storage was working. If you went to the long, you know, S3 URL for things, um, you could still reach my websites. But Route 53, the, you know, domain resolution part of the process was blocking all requests for my domains and CloudFront was disabled. So Instead of that, why didn't they freeze my account but leave the services running? Just, you know, sort of let it sit there and say you can't log in, can't change anything. Or uh, have some message when people hit the website to say it was unavailable, temp you know, or temporarily unavailable or, you know, something like that. But instead, the message was that no site exists at this address. The DNS didn't resolve as if the site didn't exist or had been pulled or it had, was never around. And so that is the worst imaginable outcome, right? If someone goes to the thing and says, oh, you know, this is not a temporary technical problem. This is the site has been, you know, the domain registration has is expired. Uh, it no longer exists. And that's what Amazon made it look like for, you know, totally unknown incomprehensible reasons 
Um, so what do you usually think when a host name comes back as we couldn't find that site? You think it's gone forever from the web. Maybe the owner took down the server, forgot to renew the domain name or anything like that. But the implication is clearly dead and gone. And that is what AWS did to me. I do not understand the rationale for this. Even if an account is blocked for legitimate reasons, why would the DNS be disabled in this heinous manner? So, you know, that caused me, if Amazon was going to treat me like I was dead and gone, I kind of turned around and wanted to do the same to them um, and eliminate them from my um, web life. This whole episode made me realize that I don't trust AWS or Amazon anymore, anyway, anyhow, anywhere, and you can investigate that link on your own. Um, I won't open it up in this video. Um, so I hope that I am able to fully free myself from dependence on them a year later. I can say that uh, that's very much um, enhanced. I am still winding down and canceling bits and pieces of things that um, just need to stay up for a little while longer. Um, and I won't say I never order from Amazon.com, but uh, you know my usage of that is 10% of what it once was. I, I, there are some cases where there is no alternative, um, but that's where I am at this point. So thank you for listening. If you did listen to the end, this is a bit of a different uh, format, um, and only you know only for those who are. Uh, very interested in this kind of material but if you if you are uh i would again thank you for your attention and i'll be back with two more vocalizations of blog posts thank you